Okay, well, um, welcome everyone to a new edition of Corpus Linguistics and Applied Linguistics uh, Research. This is the 2022 edition. And uh, this year we have four talks that explore the contributions of Corpus Linguistics to different areas of, of, of research, such as um, uh, SLA, discourse analysis, construction grammar, migration studies, and I'm sure there will be uh, other areas that will be um, uh, used and mentioned throughout the talks. Today, we have the privilege to host Professor Antonio McKinnery, and um, he is, let me, yeah, his talk today is Corpus Linguistics, Lena Corpora, and SLA, employing technology to analyze language use. Obviously, I'd like to thank these four speakers for their contribution to, to, these, to this event. And today, our thanks go to Professor Tony McKinnery. Um, I think I said earlier, he is, he is very generous to share his research uh, with us today. Um, this event is sponsored by the University of Murcia and the uh, Humanities School and our very own research uh, group at the University of Murcia. Uh, please um, make sure that you can throw your questions or your comments either in the chat box or I think preferably on the Q&A uh, section in, in these uh, Zoom webinar. This is a webinar, so this is different from regular uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much um, most of the things I wanted to say. Uh, Jachi Wo, a PhD student at the University of Cambridge doing research in the acquisition of constructions mm -hmm. in Chinese foreign language learning, uh, will chair this Q&A session at the end uh, of the talk. We will have roughly speaking maybe 20 minutes for, for questions. And she will also introduce uh, Professor Tony McKinnery. Uh, so again, I want to thank everyone that uh, is with us today. So thanks for your interest in these talks. Uh, also, thanks to the speakers. Thanks to Tony today. And uh, over to you, Yachi. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, thanks very much for the lovely introduction as well. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jachi, I'm your chair for today's event. Um, so our speaker today is Professor Tony McHenry, who needs no introduction. As we all know, Professor McHenry is one of the world's most knowledgeable and insightful researchers in both corpus linguistics and second language acquisition. And it is an incredible honor that he's able to speak to us today. I know all of us are uh, really looking forward to this presentation, so I will uh, hand over straight to Professor McHenry to begin his presentation. Thank you. Yes, yes, yeah, Jaji. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can uh, put my slides up. I think I have to change the way. Can you see my slides now? Uh, not yet. Okay, I'll get this sorted out. How about now? Yeah, now we can see okay. it. Okay, good. Uh, hello, everybody, and it's a pleasure to be talking about this topic. Uh, it's an interesting topic, of course, uh, dare I say, and it's one over the next 50 minutes where I'll try to show you some of the reasons that Corpus Linguistics and SLA could work together, how they have worked together in the past, and how they could work together even better in the future. But actually, the starting point for my thinking in this area was um, a small seminar funded by language learning, which we held at Lancaster some years ago now, uh, from which the supplement came out in 2017 in language learning. But at that seminar, an SLA researcher and a 
uh, Manicorpus researcher really had a very strong disagreement about the contribution that one may make to the other. And afterwards, I thought to myself, well, I wonder why their disagreement was so profound and, you know, how can you actually build bridges between the two areas? So in some ways, this talk today and the paper that it's based on, which I'll refer to at the end, was actually based on me trying to puzzle through what had happened uh, with this disagreement between two researchers. So my starting point is that corpus linguistics is essentially a technology or a suite of methods that we might use. Uh, and it allows us to do a few basic things. I think that Jeff Leach rightly said that the one thing that corpus allows us to do is to derive frequencies from data and that frequency information is relatively objective. But of course that frequency information can only be derived because we can do fast searches of very large volumes of data and carry out complex statistical analyses on the basis of useful frequency information that we may derive from that. Of course, in principle, we can do the same by hand and eye, and we'll be looking at some examples of that later in the talk. But the scale that we can achieve and the casual way nowadays in which we can do it, I'm sure that almost everybody listening to this presentation today has studied millions or billions of words. And that was something really which in the past was very few people have ever done or seen the results of, and typically it happened around culturally important texts like the Bible or the Quran or something like that. So it's something that we become very used to doing. But, you know, the type of thing that we can do quite easily nowadays is something like this. So here's a collocation network generated using the Langsbox program developed by Václav Prezina. And I've run it on a corpus, which I'll talk about more at the end of this presentation today, the Trinity Lancaster corpus. And I've looked at a series of associations between the word great and good. And you can see these bridging collocates, which are shared between them, player, indefinite article, idea, experience, time. That took me a matter of moments to generate. The software was very good. The technology helped me, it drew this graph. When I first drew a graph like this, I did it with a paper and pen, and that was for the book Swearing in English. Uh, and I had a giant piece of paper on my kitchen table, and I was drawing graphs like this manually. But now with software like Langsbox, we can generate graphs like this, in this case, uh, from 1500 different L2 speakers, and start to look at these shared collocates that exist between the words. So we can see that the data and the technology to search the data is available and will allow us to look at a wide range of hypotheses swiftly and automatic, but swiftly, automatically and accurately. Uh, one thing I did do many years ago eventually when I drew some of these graphs by hand was then do some programming to try and replicate the results to make sure I hadn't made any mistakes. Uh, typically speaking with computers, we don't really need to do that. Before I plunge in, I'll just say that the talk today is based on a paper which is in the Annual Review of Applied Linguistics, Volume 39. I'll give you the full URL at the end. Also, papers which I refer to today, like Brazina, McHenry and Wattam, uh, when I refer to them, you'll be able to find the reference in that paper. So the URL for that is at the end. So when I throw in names during the talk, don't worry, you can find out about the papers in the uh, paper, the uh, references in the paper itself. So corpus linguistics, as I've said, can provide access to large databases of attested language use that can reflect different forms of language, such as spoken and written L2. So yeah, we can find corpora, which allow us to look at speech, and corpora, which allow us to look at writing. And for both of those, we can find L2 corpora. We'll talk about more of those in a moment. So you know, what would be the beef be for SLA people looking at that? Well. We can say that it certainly shouldn't be about scale because with the scale of analysis afforded by these, uh, we can carry out lots of interesting tasks associated with frequency information, looking for recurrent patterns. The databases we produce are also good examples of open science. In fact, in a way, corpus linguistics was doing open science before other people came across it. The idea that you'd want to share your analyses, annotations, for example, that you have in a corpus, and the basic data itself, the corpus, is a very old one for corpus linguists. 
with organizations like ICANE, for example, being founded to do precisely that. So we have large data sets, diverse data sets, an open science model. So that sounds quite good. Also, of course, corpus findings are based on the observation of a very large number of examples of tested language use. And if your linguistic theorizing allows you to look at a tested language use, and I'd always say that it should, then corpora are very good examples of that, very good reservoirs from which you can draw realities and draw examples. So what's the problem? Well, the problems potentially are several. First of all, let's test that there is a problem. In 2009, Granger said this new resource, Learner Corpora, will soon be accepted as a bona fide data type in SLA research. But if we look at a recent, well, 2019 supplement to the Modern Language Journal, we don't find that to be the case. The whole issue is across SLA, across disciplinary borders. There are 15 contributions in this special issue. I'd recommend reading it. It's a perfectly interesting special issue. One uh, person uses some L1 corpus data, Slovakova, in her paper. Paul, in their paper, cites L1 corpus studies as corroboration for points made. While Ellis, of course, argues for the use of corpora in general. But in all 15 papers, in that special edition, not one refers to or discusses learner corpora at all. So in these state-of-the-art papers, what was predicted to be commonplace in 2019 isn't. Learner corpora are notable by their absence in that collection. Now, of course, some studies have already used learner corpora with the aims of contributing to SLA theory, so I'm not suggesting that it hasn't been done at all. And in fact, Miles uh, is a good example of that. But what I am saying is that the idea that the use of corpora would become commonplace in SLA studies has not come to pass. Now, it is the case that major language learning reference work make reference to learner corpora, but even in those works, you wouldn't describe learner corpora as central to the enterprise. They're mentioned as a side project. So you might say that there's a strong potential for conceptual and methodolog methodolog methodological innovation research on second language learning arising from the use of corpora. And actually in that um, supplement to language learning in 2017, we talk about that. But we actually need to think through why, if you like, the gears have failed to engage. We have the corpora. In principle, those corpora can show us lots of information, lots of interesting information about language acquisition, which we couldn't get from other sources, both first and second language acquisition, but here I'll focus on second language acquisition. So why is it the case that in these works, uh, in SLA, corpora are either ignored or treated as relatively peripheral or something to bring in for specific purposes. Well, I think to understand that fully, we have to think about the past, work through to the present, and then move into the future. What about the pre-computational era? I mentioned before that very few people in the pre-computational era had access to large data sets and frequencies derived from them. And I said also that often it was the case that where you did get that, it was with culturally important work. Well, actually, in the early 20th century, language teaching and language learning research did shift in the direction of looking at large volumes of data in order to derive frequencies, most typically in the context of frequency dictionaries, dictionaries which were informed by the frequency of words so that words could be organized in the dictionary in order to maximize learning. That was the theory. So you have people like Herman in 1924 producing uh, a corpus in essence of French to generate a, a, a learner corpus, well, uh, a dictionary for learners. Similarly, Buchanan in 1929 with Spanish, producing a Spanish learner frequency dictionary. And of course, more famously, but actually much later, 
uh, West in 1953, doing the same with English. So there was actually in the early part of the 20th century quite a tradition of using L1 corpora and constructing them, and on the basis of that, producing frequency based dictionaries which would be of assistance to learners. That work was painstaking, difficult to replicate, and expensive to undertake. So the work of people like Herman um, and Buchanan were actually grant funded and it took them a long time to do their work with some hundreds of thousands of words of data, similarly with West. We can't replicate that work now, I'm not aware of anybody who knows what was in the corporate collected by Herman and Buchanan, and it took them a great deal of effort to do it. So these weren't exactly learner corpus research studies, as I've said, they were frequency lists built from L1 data. So when did learner corpus research begin? Where we actually shifted away from looking at L1 corpus information, which may be of assistance to language learners, through to looking at the productions of language learners, L2 speech and writing. Well, arguably, that happened before the phrase learner corpora was introduced. So rather than jump ahead now, and think about the work, important as it is, of Granger, which I'll consider in a moment. I'd just like to reflect on the fact that prior to that work, there was actually a focus on research which collected reasonably large volumes for the time of L2 productions and studied those as the basis of theorizing or inspecting theoretical assumptions. So, for example, Juvenen. In 1989, did work on Finnish learners of Swedish in this respect, building in essence a small corpus of Finnish learners of Swedish L2 productions. Similarly, Cornu and Delahaye on Flemish, Flemish learners of French did similar work. Also, other studies exist. Hubner, for example, in 1983 and 1985, did some studies of a Hmong learner English uh, class. And those studies, along with the others, predate what we'd normally think of as learner corpus research, which developed in the late 1990s. So the idea of looking at L2 production, collecting examples of it, putting it together into a data set, and then exploring that data set, where those examples are actually produced in context, in this case, language uh, learning contexts, is not necessarily as new an idea as one might think. Now, Granger in 1998, of course, noted that much work on the categorization and analysis of errors made by language learners actually predated learner corpus research. So I'm not suggesting that Granger claimed to be breaking ground that wasn't broken. She actually says this herself. But actually, in fairness to Granger, a lot of this earlier work was typically based on small, paper-based corpora of a tested learner language. Uh, and some of the data sets may have been larger, though still paper-based. So for example, Ferk, Harpstrup, and Philipson had a larger database, I think, but it was still paper-based. So we're lacking scale and we're lacking computation in these early studies. Okay, so after that point, we moved on to learner corpora. And I'd always point to the International Corpus of Learner English as probably the first such uh, enterprise. I'd say that that's the thing that started off this field of learner corpora. It self-consciously drew upon the rich methodological background of corpus linguistics. How can I say this? Well, if you read Granger's work, that's clear. But also, of course, Sylvian visited Lancaster and worked closely with Geoffrey Leach around that time, and myself as well, but principally Jeff. And Sylvian was there really to do that, to self-consciously draw upon the methodological background of corpus linguistics to structure some of the thinking that went into the early work on learning English using corpora. Now, the scale went beyond what had previously been achieved by researchers such as Juvenal, for example in terms of the volume of data collected, the number of respondents. And also crucially, it provided a machine readable, reusable resource that was easily accessible. This was not paper-based at all, I think. I don't think there is a paper-based version 
of the Ickle Caucus. This really was born digital, so to speak, well, transcribed digital. Also, it covered a range of L1 backgrounds for the L2 speakers in the caucus, rather than being rather narrow and focused as many of those early studies I mentioned just before were. So, what did this bring us? Well, the reliance on corpus research brought advantages. Sylvian didn't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting of thinking about the methods to be used, the statistics to be used, etc. Corpus linguistics provided a methodological framework for a lot of that earlier work. Also, the shift to the computer, of course, made the extraction of complex frequency data much easier. That, in turn, enabled a wide range of statistical analyses on the data. And I remember around that time talking to Sylvian and also Sylvie de Kock, who was there, and thinking of interesting and innovative ways that we could look at the data, ways which now might seem commonplace, but which at the time were actually quite interesting. So for example, we did some interesting work looking at multi-word sequences in spoken learner corpora around that time. And although, as I say, it seems commonplace now, it was new then. And of course, also automated and manual linguistic analyses could be undertaken and shared. That's a key point. So it isn't simply the case that we could do the analyses as say, for example, Herman could in the 1920s. We could share our analyses in the form of corpus annotations, for example, and we could share the data sets too so that people could try to repeat our analyses, and if they couldn't, raise that as an issue with us. So the packages and measures developed that aided studies of L1 corpora, such as concordancing, collocation, frequency lists, keyword analysis, multi-word unit analysis, and corpus annotation, helped with the study of L2 corpora also. And here, in terms of the present, Let's think about a few corpora that exist. Of course, the Louvain family of corpora are important in this respect. We have ICL, which is short argumentative essays. Um, I think nowadays it's about 5.5 million words of L2 written production. Loch Ness, which as you can see is in three parts. That's the, Brit uh, the L1 um, corresponding data set to ICL. Lindsay, 11 different L1 backgrounds in just over 1 million words of orthographically transcribed spoken data. So that's L2 production. And Loch Neck, which is a small uh, L1 control corpus to be compared with Lindsay. So this looks great. We've got data that we can use. And it's the great credit of the Louvain team that over the years, they and people who've worked with them have put these resources together. So and in the present, if we can move from the past, dozens of learner corpora are available. I'm sure that many of you listening this afternoon have probably created some such corpora yourselves. Let's just think about three large ones that are out there. There's the Longman Learner Corpus, at least in the installation we have here at Lancaster, that's over 10 million words of written L2 data from English language learners with a range of L1 backgrounds across a wide range of English proficiency levels. Or there's the ETS, the Educational Testing Service Corpus. If you go to the Linguistic Data Consortium, for example, uh, there you can find the ETS corpus. Uh, and there it's composed of 12,100 written English essays produced as part of the uh, TOEFL test uh, with learners from 11 L1 backgrounds. Or there's the Cambridge University Press Cambridge Learner Corpus. Uh, last time I looked, that was over 50 million words of exam scripts from a range of English language examinations produced by over 220,000 students from 173 countries. So a large volume of data characterized by quite diverse L1 backgrounds. So this all sounds incredibly positive. Learner corpora have been explored extensively by LCR researchers and also commercial publishers. In fact, I usually set the people, uh, people the challenge nowadays of getting them to look for materials produced by some of the major British publishers for 
language learning and trying to find some materials which aren't learner corpus based or which don't boast about the use of learner corpora. They're quite commonplace, certainly in the British ELT industry. And of course, there is a, a lovely, strong, thriving learner corpus research community. So what's the problem? Well, the extent to which these corpora are used beyond the learner's uh, corpus research community is less clear. And use by SLA researchers, as I've implied already, is actually vanishingly low. So let's come to the nub of this issue now. I've been talking about this as a problem and musing about it. We've looked at some of the data and concluded that maybe that isn't the problem. There's lots of it. What are the issues then? Well, actually, a review of Sylvian's book by Lessard in 1999 actually has some telling quotes in it, which actually I'm going to argue still apply today to the learner corpus research enterprise to a degree. So Lessard said, corpora used are still relatively small, which hinders the use of statistical tests. Well, we'll go on and look at some examples in a moment which shows that that's still true to an extent. Also, Lessard says, apart from a few theoretical constructs, such as overuse and underuse with respect to native speaking usage, there is a serious lack of contact with the notions of current linguistic theory. I think that's still true to an extent. Uh, learner corpus research itself does things which are important, but in terms of actually docking with, so to speak, uh, current research and theories in SLA, there's less work evident. And indeed, uh, Cochetto, Castello and Ackley uh, in 2015, large work on learner corpora, as reviewed by Brazina and Bettini, shows that really in terms of less harder review, not much has changed. If you read the Brazina and Bettini review, it has very, very strong echoes of the Lessard review of Grand Jay. Oops, I'm back. Okay, so there's an issue here in terms of quantity and quality. Let me go back to some of those large corpora that I mentioned earlier in the talk, and also go back to the observation from Lessard that there isn't enough data for some of the statistical tests that you may want to do. Okay, well, if we look at the ICL corpus, words which I wouldn't describe as particularly rare, such as pesta, sunburn, and vases, occur only once in ICL. So obviously, if you want to look at what I call these sort of medium frequency words, a corpus of the size of ICL just isn't big enough. And you end up doing what you do with many corpora around one million words, is simply looking at things by virtue of the fact that they're frequent, not necessarily important. And of course, when we're working with these corpora, combining factors can lead to data sparsity issues. Corpora that appear large, when you quote a headline figure like one million words, can suddenly become rather small when you actually think to yourself, well, for my research, I need to look at L1 well speaker's background, there has to be this, their age has to be in this range, um, their gender has to be this, the attainment level on the CEFR has to be that. You can certainly find that a very large corpus turns into a very small one or a non-existent one for your purpose. Okay, well, in this little study, I'm gonna look at the long and learner corpus. Uh, which has been used in the long and active study program um, set of publications, for example. That's about 9 million words. Has people represented in it of 18 L1 backgrounds, eight levels of proficiency, three target varieties of English, and it includes nine different task types. So from the point of view of wanting to design an experiment using the corpus, which took those factors into account, this sounds quite good. I should be able to curate data using background, proficiency level, target variety, and task type in order to explore specific hypotheses that the theory may have, which actually requires those variables. But can I do it? Actually, when you think of combining those particular variables, you actually start to generate very large numbers of categories, 
So if we multiply the number of backgrounds available by the number of levels of proficiency, by the varieties of English, by the task types, we realize that the metadata in the corpus allows us in principle to generate 3,888 separate categories of data in the corpus. So this apparently large, well-balanced data set, when explored through the metadata, becomes rather unbalanced. Because the data is not evenly spread, if we go back to our example of the words great and good, and look in the set essay task, and say that we want to look at intermediate learners of English, uh, of anyone at uh, L1 background, with British English as a target variety, we actually find 2,832 examples overall of that. But if we then look at the use of good and great for the Thai and Malay L1s, due to the small size of the relevant samples, 2,886 words for Thai, 3,840 words for Malay, there's nothing to say about great and good. There isn't actually that much data. L1 Arabic speakers have 141,248 words of set essay data in the corpus. But for British English target, the size of the data shrinks to 113,562 words. If we then focus on intermediate level speakers, we have only 18,945 words to work with. For Czech L1 speaker data, there are 61,711 words of essay data available, and all have British English as their target. So all permutations with American English and Australian English for Czech L1 writers are empty sets. If that's the target variety we're interested in, the corpus is silent on them. Likewise, the corpus contains no data for Korean writers with a target variety other than American English. So a large corpus does not guarantee a bounty of evidence for any research question that might be put to that corpus. As we've seen, it's possible to think of combinations of metadata which are entirely reasonable to think of, but for which we have little to no data available. So decisions made when constructing a corpus mean that the corpus can be used to address some questions but not others, even if it may appear at first glance that a corpus might allow one to investigate a specific question. In other words, I look at the metadata and say, well, it has this metadata, so surely if I combine it, I'll find some data. Well, actually the answer is no. Unless the corpus is actually designed actively in advance to ensure that there is metadata available for any combination of metadata, then the corpus may in fact be full of hollow promises in the sense that some combinations of data will yield no data. So we need to be clear about this or corpus linguistics may be seen on occasion to overpromise and ultimately to disappoint. So we say, I've got a big corpus, it has all of this metadata and somebody asks you a question, you say, sorry, I have no data on that specific thing, even though I've implied I might because of the nature of the metadata. So we also need to accept that simply gathering more data, even if it is well-structured, may not be the answer. So if I gather more data within the Longman framework, it implies that that framework, to some extent, is the framework that should be used. However, if my research question lies beyond the Longman corpus, no matter how much data I collect, I won't be able to answer some of the questions that lie beyond that framework. So for example, if I'm interested in data which has a target variety of, I don't know, New Zealand English, I can collect as much target variety, British English, American English, Australian English as I want. That won't be the answer. The answer will actually be related to changing the nature of the corpus, changing the sampling framework in order to address that question. Also, another point that one needs to accept when one looks at these learner corpora is that although the numbers of learners in the corpus is fairly large, the variety of those learners is still rather limited. So if we go back to the Louvain family of corpora, for example, 
And this isn't a criticism because the Louvain people are clear about this limitation, but limitation it still is. We find a lot of work done by, for example, in the L1 data that they have, um, British university students. Now, British university students may or may not be representative of all speakers of British English. British university students may or may not be representative of uh, other speakers of British English with different levels of education. And you can carry on with comments of that sort. But they're very narrow in terms of the types of people taking, um, producing the data. Similarly, with the corporate oriented towards tests, that captures a certain type of learner who actually want accreditation. There are plenty of other language learners who never actually seek accreditation for their language learning capacity. And they are pretty much totally unrepresented in the corpora that we have. Also, if we're interested in a very low frequency feature, even a larger corpus may yield insufficient or no examples. So this is something which I'm quite familiar with from talking to theoretical linguists, for example. They're interested in very marginal examples in order to test their theories that are unlikely to occur in a tested language use. They have fundamentally low frequency. So we might be able to collect billions of words of data to find one or two examples, but A, we may not find the examples, B, of course, other methods may allow those researchers to proceed more swiftly. Elicitation, for example. So if somebody says to me, are corpora the answer to all questions, whether that be learner corpora or not, I always say no. We actually need to triangulate and curate methods together in order to look at questions about language use. But learner corpora and corpora in general are very useful tools to have available to us or ways of approaching the data and questions to have available to us if we are looking at something because they can yield some insights that other methods really can't. So there are a few currently, a few, currently few well-structured data sets that permit the study of the variables relevant to SLA, such as proficiency level and sociolinguistic variables, task or contextual features. So there is a major drawback. Also, if some potential users of learner corpora approach existing corpora with a question that cannot be answered by the data, they'll use different methods. And the corpora themselves, this represent a bottleneck, which, while it has widened over time, still exists. Beyond the bottleneck, SLA researchers remain concerned about the relevance of usage data to theories of learning also. So that's one of those questions which has been there since the beginning of corpus linguistics. Is this actually the object of study for linguists or is something else the object of study? We're at a fundamental question of epistemology. What is the epistemological status of performance data or attested language use? And some SLA researchers would actually question that still. Now, I'm not going to argue against them today. What I'm doing is simply outlining issues and explaining why some of those researchers would have difficulties with accepting the use of learner corpora. Some other issues, a great bulk of available learning data is written. Uh, it's not spoken. That, of course, is usually purely a matter of convenience because written data is much easier to collect than spoken data. But it's useful to look at spoken data because, of course, often oral proficiency is both tested and something which language learners wish to achieve. And although some conversational spoken learner corpora have been produced, and indeed I've mentioned one or two examples, say, for example, from uh, Louvain, uh, they've been typically limited in terms of features such as size and task type. Size is understandable because learner corpora of this sort and corpora in general of this sort are still difficult and expensive to produce. Another point as well about spoken learner corpora is that sometimes they weren't really developed with the exploration, say, for example, of conversational competence in mind. It was actually uh, issues of phonetics and phonology that were being explored when these corpora were built. 
So they can be very small, but heavily annotated, for example, for uh, phonetic and prosodic features. So thinking then about what SLA researchers might want to do with such core, perhaps speculated on some of the things that they may wish to do so far. Uh, but if we go to Saville, Troik and Barto, they identify a basic set of questions that SLA seeks to address. Firstly, what exactly does the L2 learner come to know? Secondly, how does the learner acquire this knowledge? And thirdly, why are some learners more successful than others? Now, across those three questions, I'd say that for the first question, corporate certainly have something to contribute. If your theoretical predisposition, as mine is, is towards functionalism or usage-based models of uh, language acquisition, then what learners are exposed to and their productions become quite interesting to us. How does the learner acquire this knowledge? Well, once again, looking at certain types of corpus evidence might allow us to start to give some of the answer to that. But of course, other sources of evidence need to be used as well. Why are some learners more successful than others? Well, setting the question of exposure to one side this might be something where corpora have less of a role to play, because here, I guess, we'd be squirrely into the territory of psycholinguistics. But thinking about those three questions anyway, and thinking about whether or not I as a corpus linguist have anything to contribute, my initial reaction to it is yes. But the key fault line between SLA research and learner corpus research is that SLA research has been largely theory-driven and to date has tended to test theory through psycholinguistic and other quasi-experimental methods as a consequence. In other words, they have a theory as a prior and they test out statements within that theory. And in seeking to state, test statements in that theory, they compose experiments that they believe will allow them to test that hypothesis or that statement. Now, I've given you a picture of uh, a book. I thought I'd plug my latest book, but it's not quite a wild plug because that book, um, which has just come out from Cambridge this month, uh, last month actually, uh, tries to look at the interface between theory and corpus linguistics, something which hasn't been done a great deal. Linguistics, uh, corpus linguistics has tended to be descriptive and pre-theoretical. And in that book, we try to puzzle through the type of reasoning that an SLA researcher, for example, or anybody else wanting to do experimental work does when trying to test theories. And in that book, we try to show how corpora can help in that process. So even for that type of SLA researcher, I'd say if we have reasoning like that, which is in this book, we may be able to help them get to the point where they could say, OK, for certain questions arising from my theory, I may be able to use corpus data, and that would be a good thing. But actually, in doing that, we're really just enabling something which SLA research has actually been permissive of for a long time. So Ellis, for example, in 1994, this is Rod Ellis uh, rather than Tother Ellis, uh, Nick Ellis, who I was talking about before, noted three types of data used by SLA researchers. And Ellis says the first type is language as produced by learners of a language, whether that be natural or elicited, and if elicited, clinical or experimental. B, metalinguistic judgments, and C, self-report data. Now, we might add a fourth class here, given the current prevalence in SLA research of observational data, like eye tracking and brain scanning. So we may actually want to add a fourth type of data to what Ellis listed there, but that to one side, the key is Ellis and other SLA researchers have always accepted that languages produced by learners of a language could potentially be important data. But I think what's been lacking to some extent is that way of demonstrating that you can incorporate corpus data into a rigorous exploration of hypotheses coming forth from a theory. And that really is what that new book is about.
Okay. So SLA is always used a range of method, and that includes the exploration of naturally occurring learner language. But of course, it would be foolish to pretend that psycholinguistics hasn't actually been the mainstay of SLA research. Uh, Those so-called social approaches have been gaining ground in recent years. By contrast, learner corpus researchers have been more exploratory and pre-theoretical in their approach to learner language and have used corporate to explore norms and differences with the field, heavily driven by a preoccupation with, and here I'm going back to the words of Lessard and his comments on Granger, basic theoretical constructs such as overuse and underuse. Now, this, of course, is where uh, we find corpus data well adapted to explore the idea, but from the perspective of SLA, these are basic theoretical constructs not whole theories in themselves. So what about the future? How do we reach areas in SLA that have not benefited from the use of large scale quantitative analyses of attested language use until now? How do we promote innovation in areas of SLA that have already benefited considerably? So I show the space in there from quantitative and specifically corpus-based methods. How do we do that? We've heard people claim it's gonna happen. How does it actually come to pass? Well, I think we need to do at least two things. We need to address the spoken corpus deficit, which is still profound. And we need to permit neglected areas to be explored. Thinking about the spoken corpus deficit, more data is becoming available. I'll give you two examples. One is by Shinishikawa um, at Kobe University in Japan, focusing on uh, English language learners in uh, Pacific Asia region. And the ICNAIL corpus that he's produced actually does have a quite nice section within it of dialogues from a range of L1 backgrounds in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, I've been lucky enough to read an advanced copy of Shin's book on Icknail. And I've given you a little picture of it there, which I think is coming out next month or certainly before the end of the year. And I'd certainly recommend that book to anybody who's interested in looking at uh, learner corpus construction in that region and also looking at some work undertaken on um, dialogic corpora uh, from the Asia Pacific region of L2 uh, speakers of English. Another corpus I have to mention, of course, it's one of my own, is the Trinity Lancaster corpus. You can read the details of that corpus there. But that is a corpus of nothing but orthographically transcribed speech undertaken by people uh, having conversations with L1 speakers who happen to be examiners. And they're doing so in an exam setting. They've been uh, training for that. And they actually undertake a range of tasks in that exam setting as well. And it's distinct from other spoken language tests in that we're not getting people to produce fragments. These are sustained conversations that are occurring in that data. So that's very useful data that's coming online now. And I'll give you a URL at the end where you can go and find out more about that corpus and have a little go at playing with it yourself. But the deficit in terms of spoken corpora has consequence in terms of the research that's undertaken on it. Now, this is some data which I produced a few years ago, but I think the overall message from it is still the same. I looked at 1,144 learner corpus research publications in the past three decades that were stored on the Louvain website, and that's a very useful website if you actually want to get a very good bibliography of research undertaken in this tradition. And on that website, you find that pragmatics is an oddly neglected area of learner corpus research, principally, I think, because of the lack of interactional data. Um, there is very little data available to look at, say, for example, pragmatics and interaction, speech, the sort that you could do with ICNAIL or with TLC, for example. As a consequence, only about 16 studies that I found focused on pragmatics in spite of the importance of the area. And of those studies, most of them were 
lexically driven, just looking at discourse markers with only a couple of looking at things like speech acts. As a consequence, um, L2, uh, SLA researchers have noted this dearth of work on speech and dearth of work on pragmatics. And uh, I've given you a quote there, which I've given you in full from the Culpeper, Mackey and Taguchi book. And they note a dearth of studies of pragmatic development using corpus techniques. And also Culpeper et al. note that there are issues of balancing and controlling variables, just of the sort that we've been talking about today. And that this then makes it very difficult for SLA to do research with this because they can't balance the variables. So some of the issues which I've been talking about are certainly those which are mentioned in the SLA literature, which discourage them from using corpora. But hopefully corpora like ICNAIL and Trinity Lancaster corpus can start to resolve issues like that, giving sufficient data of the right sort to allow the study of interaction between L1 and L2 speakers, for example, and therefore also look at some of the issues that might arise in terms of pragmatics, and also look at some of the issues which SLA researchers might like to look at, where certain variables are coming together, which require spoken language data to explore. But let me give you a little example now, which actually isn't in the paper. I don't think I've ever published, I don't think I ever will, but it might interest you. Um, looking at laughter as a pragmatic device, a uh, paralinguistic feature. It's well transcribed in the Trinity Corpus. I don't think I've really read much in the way of literature on the use of laughter uh, in the L2 examination room or L2 classroom for that matter. Few studies, but nothing that's gone into in great depth. But laughter is an important pragmatic resource. Cultural models of it may vary, and you may expect some type of L1 interference in it as well. Laughter is interactive, it varies by background, proficiency, and task, is what we find in the Trinity Lancaster corpus. Lancaster, uh, laughter is a highly variable feature in the corpus. It's complex, but without suitable corpus data, a large scale uh, investigation of such dialogic interaction is difficult and or qualitative. So you could do small scale studies a bit, but it's actually only really by looking at something like laughter in a large corpus that you start to see how this pragmatic resource may vary. Look at this. This is the conversation task within the Trinity Lancaster corpus. Across the bottom there are L1 backgrounds for the speakers and there are the 95% competence limits around the mean in terms of the numbers, uh, numbers, number of times that laughter is produced uh, by the um, students, the L2 speakers in the corpus. And it's interesting here because you see the culture of the language is the thing that seems to be important. So uh, Mexican Spanish speakers and Peninsula Spanish speakers have different rates of laughter associated with their production. So laughter seems to be something which varies here by culture. And you can see also it varies by individual, more so in the case of Portuguese. Okay, thank you, Jati, uh, than say, for example, in the case of Hindi. In terms of the discussion task, again, we see similar pictures, wide range of variation for Portuguese speakers, more limited for Hindi speakers. And again, we have some difference between the Spanish uh, peninsula and Mexican speakers, but not as great as in the uh, conversation task. But also we see laughter declining. So it seems to be a pragmatic device and possibly also a strategic device for learners at lower proficiency levels, as opposed to higher proficiency levels. Here it's being used as a handy filler. Later on, it's being used more expertly, if you like, by people using laughter appropriately in context. So I think that when we think about doing SLA research and using corpora, we shouldn't be thinking of dominance or directionality. We shouldn't be thinking that SLA researchers need to stop using the methods they're using and use corpora. Similarly, SLA researchers shouldn't be thinking that corpus linguists have nothing to say of theoretical importance. So learner corpus studies do not necessarily represent, to quote Granger, 
a real improvement over the narrow empirical foundation of most SLA studies. Because in order to claim that, you need to understand why a particular method was chosen to study a particular hypothesis. If that method, such as elicitation, is more appropriate for that hypothesis than corpora, then I don't think corpora represent a real improvement at all as an empirical foundation. Where corpora can do their job, they may be an improvement, but where they shouldn't be applied, they would not be. But likewise, SLA theory may not provide learner corpus research with theoretical frameworks which would enable rigorous interpretation or explanation of the data. If our focus is on producing, say, for example, classroom learning materials on the basis of learner corpus research, then these rigorous theoretical frameworks may not actually be particularly helpful. So my call is for a variable geometry of research method in response to specific research questions. I'm about to stop, Jaji. You'll be delighted to know, but before I do, I'll just give you a few resources. First of all, uh, if you want to read a much more coherent version of that talk than the one that I gave, you can look at this paper, which was published in the Annual Review of Applied Linguistics, where I run through some of the main arguments I presented this afternoon. Also, if you want to do more on corpus linguistics, our MOOC is currently running. Uh, some of you may have taken it. For those of you who haven't, you might want to look at it. We certainly cover things such as learner corpora uh, within there. Also, if you want to look at some nice up-to-date work at the interface between corpus linguistics and second language acquisition, the Routledge Handbook of Second Language Acquisition and Corpora is out this year, I think, um, and it's a gold mine of such work, so please do look at that. And finally, as promised, some URLs for you. Uh, the top one here is a tiny URL for that uh, ARAL paper. That's easier to write than the very long URL. Uh, this URL here allows you to find out more about the Trinity Lancaster corpus and also follow a link which allows you to search it. And the last link there, of course, is the link for the MOOC. So if you want to go ahead and have a look at what's on the MOOC, uh, have a go at that. So feel free to screenshot that screen or whatever it is you need to do, write very quickly uh, in order to take down those URLs. Thank you very much for listening. You've all been enormously kind to come along and listen to what I have to say. I hope that my musings and ramblings on the topic of why corpus linguistics and SLA research haven't got on as well as one might have imagined initially have proved insightful for you. And I now hand back over to Jachi. Jachi, I'll just leave this screen up for a moment for anybody who wants to take the URLs and then switch over to my camera. Okay, okay. Well, thank you so much, um, Tony, for such a wonderful and for sharing your thoughts on the, the present and past and the future with us. So we have um, uh, we have lots of questions coming in, um, but uh, um, I have summarized some of the questions during your talk. So right. I think one of the themes you might have come across this a lot, so is the uh, uh, the effective size for corpus and uh, questions from a few of our audience. So what's your advice, what's your thoughts on the, um, the, the corpus side to draw uh, implications for L2 teaching and um, research? Okay. Well, some of it, of course, is uh, empirically testable in the sense that if you do your stats well enough, you should get some idea of the strength of your observation. So I'd always say, uh, look to your stats first and foremost, um, because if they're good stats, you should actually get a sense from them of whether or not this is some type of reliable inference, at least in terms of the stat itself and its assumptions about language. Let me be careful about that. So I'd say look to that first. But I would also say, this may be more controversial, that we shouldn't necessarily focus on stats and also statistical findings, because some of the uh, hypotheses that you may develop in SLA, or any other theory for that matter, may be falsified by a single telling example. So even when you can only go to a corpus and say, you know what, there's only about 3,000 words here that's relevant for my research question because I need this particular configuration of metadata, I'd still say, look at those 3,000 words 
maybe giving stats on them isn't the way forward. But do try and check whether those productions actually conform with your hypothesis. Because if you find an utterance in context which is clearly acceptable, but it runs counter to your hypothesis, this utterance itself is potentially, in epistemological terms, worth its weight in gold, because it's exactly what you want to see. So I would always say, uh, ensure that you have sufficient data according to the measures that you're using in order to make reliable inferences, but do not overlook the possibility that even very small volumes of data, especially for very precise questions, may yield very valuable results. Well, thank you so much. I learned. <laughs> I will use okay. that for my research. Um, <laughs> I guess the, the next types of question will be uh, building a corpora. And so what sort of um, uh, resource can you use? And one question from, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to put your names. So uh, Abdelaziz, um, his, her question was, um, when analyze, uh, when building a corpora, uh, and Elena, so when building corpus, like, would it, can we use bilingual speech for um, to analyze L2 acquisition? Well, I think you probably know what I'm about to say. It depends on your research question. If your research question is focused on such speech, of course you can. If, on the other hand, you're looking at a research question that isn't focused on that sort of speech, of course you can't. So I've always said that with a corpus, the question of, is it useful to me, is driven not by the corpora you have available, but by the research questions that you're asking. Think about the research questions you're asking, and then think about whether the data or your plans for collection of data fit that question. If they do not, there is no point in doing it, no point whatsoever. Because unfortunately for you, come your vibe or whatever, somebody will say the data does not support the question. So always think about that. So if you're thinking about gathering a certain type of uh, data in order to explore uh, language acquisition, think to yourself, is this the type of data which my theoretical framing of this problem says that I should be looking at in order to explore it? If it isn't, don't do it. Well, I hope this um, Tony has answered some of the questions, the later on questions and the previous questions. Um, the other, so we have a corpse, uh, and corpse analysis questions as well. Hmm. So when analyzing question, I know it's too general, but when analyzing okay. uh, the, the corpse data, um, what the pitfalls would you um, remind people to avoid? Pitfalls, well, we've covered one already. Make sure that your data matches your question. Um, <laughs> I've seen studies, unfortunately, where it doesn't. Um, and you have to politely point this out. So that's one of the major pitfalls. Think carefully of your question. Another one, which is similar, but slightly more subtle, is think of the assumptions that the measures you're using in order to explore language, make about language, and then decide whether or not those assumptions are accurate. And if they're not, how material that is for your analysis. What are you talking about, Tony, you're now saying? Well, say, for example, with um, significance testing. Uh, significance testing can often assume normal distribution, and language is rarely normally distributed. So think to yourself, does this have an impact on the results? The measure makes an assumption about distribution, language doesn't actually meet that measure of distribution, what does that mean for my results? So think about that very carefully. Also, say, for example, if you look at an effect size measure like mutual information, you need to be aware of the limitations of it. So going back to that supplement on language learning, uh, Dana Kabalasova, that's a Brazilian and I wrote, and well, what I think is a nice paper, but I'm bound to say I think it's a nice paper, uh, looking at different association measures and what they show you about collocation. And we looked at some of the assumptions behind the association measure and therefore tried to show how this colored your view of what you are actually seeing in the data. 
So you say, for example, something like the z-score is heavily driven by frequency. On the other hand, something like mutual information, which I mentioned at the start of this ramble, um, actually really exaggerates effect for low frequency items. So you need to understand these things. Otherwise, you might say, oh, mutual information says this is an extremely strong collocation. No, uh, what you found is something that's quite rare and mutual information has this glitch of saying that that's a strong association. Or, oh, Z-score says this is very important. No, it's frequent. That's why Z-score, you need to understand the measures. So that's another important pitfall, I'd say, which goes right across corpus linguistics, but it's also important in learner corpus research. Another slight pitfall, I do it myself sometimes, is taking very abstracted views of the data, which actually probably move away from the individual data to the extent that it's actually describing no one and describing everybody. So at the beginning of my talk, I gave you a graph derived from 1500 speakers. Well, any one speaker actually may have varied from that graph that graph was actually a sort of gestalt, if you like. I was putting all of their usage together, but the usage may have been individual. So I may have been getting a view of that community of speakers, which actually didn't characterize any one speaker in that community. So never lose sight of the individual would be another point that I would make. It's very tempting, especially when looking at large data sets to aggregate performance. But actually for me, language is driven by the performance of individuals. They may actually coalesce around different usages, but nonetheless, they are individuals. And as we saw in that example with laughter at the end, individuals can vary with respect to the use of laughter. We saw that very markedly in the Portuguese learners of English. So those are a few issues in terms of pitfalls that I think about continually and actively when I try to use corpus data. Thank you. So, um, there is an, uh, lots of questions coming in. Uh, so another question, I guess, um, James um, and I would like you to maybe give a little bit of elaboration on the your in your presentation. You said the future uh, lies in developing more corpus and more. Uh, we have more approach and methods. Could you, um, James, want to know what exactly these methods are? <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about the corpora and then the methods. Yeah. The corpora, I think, a really good idea, and this is, I think, to some extent, what we tried to do with the Trinity Lancaster corpus, is to talk to some SLA people and work out what it is they would like to find out from the corpora and allow that to inform your design. So talking to Alison Mackey, it was obvious that pragmatics was an issue for her and that some of the features that were in the corpus would be useful for her. If only we'd take her concerns into account when constructing the corpus, then when the corpus was built, it would be of use to her. So a lot of learner corpora, of course, are not constructed with the needs of second language acquisition researchers in mind. And the form of those corpora, or the nature in terms of mode of production in this case, may actually be altered uh, if we actually want to address uh, what the um, speak what the SLA researchers are doing. In terms of methodological innovation, well, one, I'd say uh, looking at methods which actually put the individual front and center of our analysis. So always putting on those interval bars to show how um, useful the methods of uh, the averages are, that's one thing. But also looking at short sequences and looking at highly variable sequences. What do I mean about that? Looking at the TLC, some work I'm doing with Izzy Clark at the moment rests upon the question of how can we adapt some of the techniques used by Doug Biber, for example, in looking at uh, multi-dimension analysis to looking at something as small as a turn in learner language. Typically, multi-dimensional analysis finds that enormously difficult because it requires frequency data Oh, good, corpora have frequency data, you say, but wait there. We want to look at it by turn. And in each turn, there is very little frequency data. So how can we get the rigor of the approach of multidimensional analysis in a context where most of the time, the value that you derive from the turn will be 
zero. You don't see it. You don't see the feature that you're looking for. So Izzy and I have been doing quite a lot of work on that, following up on some of her work on Twitter. So there's a very nice example of how a focus on the individual and also a focus on individual terms can actually drive us to think of new methods and new ways of trying to approach that data where we have fundamental problems and those problems arise because we understand how the measure works. Of course I could run Luke's technique on the terms, of course I could, and it would give me some answers, but they'd be meaningless. Uh, and Doug would be the first person to accept this because there isn't sufficient frequency information to power those techniques properly. So what can you do? And uh, Izzy and I have an answer. And if any of you look in a recent uh, edition of register studies, admittedly it's not focused on learning language, it's looking at short press reports. Um, there's some idea there of the technique that we're using to look at learner language uh, in this way. Is that okay, Jaji? Is that a, a good example of each? Yes, that's very, very, very good examples. <laughs> I hope. Um, so, yes, I, I'm, uh, your answer is always clear and precise. <laughs> oh, you're very blunt. I'm sure it's not always true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm happy to summarize some uh, questions as well. Sorry, I couldn't read uh, all the questions. So, the next question people are very curious about the software you use for uh, analyzing the Trinity corpus. And yeah. so they, what, what software did you use to transcribe the spoken data, a question from phone, and what software did you use to, for uh, data analysis? Yeah, I think the software we used for transcription was a standard, um, we didn't do it automatically. We looked into automation and the results we got were so awful that automation plus human editing would have taken longer than human doing it themselves. So actually it was done uh, through standard um, audio typing methods, uh, but the person doing it was trained and supervised um, and they used the foot pedal, etc. But the results that we got from speech to text were so awful that we had no other way of doing it. It might be the case that if we did it again now, we, we run those experiments to see if it was no longer true. I think it probably still would be because some of the recordings that we got from Trinity were quite poor quality and we needed to listen carefully, even as a human expert, to work out what was being said. And indeed, we did abandon large numbers of recordings because they weren't that audible in fact. So that's that. In terms of the software that we use for the analyses we do, it varies. So if I'm doing the work I've just described with Izzy Clark, she has our programs that do that new type of analysis for us. But if we're using standard techniques or even relatively experimental techniques, sometimes we can rely on Lanxbox, which um, Bats Labs developed, which has all of the standard techniques in it. It's metadata aware, and it also has some interesting features such as A, you can do collocation networks if you want to look at those. But the, another feature I really like of Bats Lab's Lanxbox program is you can go in and edit the equations. First of all, you can see the equations. So for that process of actually working out what the mathematics is actually assuming about your data, you can actually see the equation that the program is using. It's not hidden away. And if you disagree with some of the assumptions or want to try your own measure, you can actually author your own um, statistics into the program itself. So we use Langsbox for that reason. It's very transparent. So if I say I use Langsbox and I did an MI, you can open up Langsbox and look at the equation that Langsbox uses to derive an MI. Is that helpful? I, I can, on behalf of the audience, yes. Okay, okay. Um, I, um, I'm wearing the time is passing. I guess I have a yes. one more okay. question for you, Tony. One more before dinner then. <laughs> so one more question, hold on there. So okay. uh, there's another common theme is uh, about using corpus for teaching. Teaching. So would you, um, question from uh, Katerina and Yun and um, uh, Baju said, is it, do you think it's helpful to have a corpus that um, from course books, I guess textbooks, and also how do we use the best way to use corpus to inform teaching? 
Okay, well, yes, I do think it's important to have a corpus of textbooks. Uh, in fact, if we go back to what Rod Ellis said about the uh, information that we need in order to look at um, second language acquisition, uh, we need to look at inputs. Also, we think back to the Seville, Troika and Barto uh, questions. How does the learner acquire this knowledge? Well, partly it's through textbooks. So in terms of inputs, if we don't really look back at the corpora of textbooks, where we know them, it's difficult to make conclusions about those inputs and for corporate to make their contribution there. Some years ago, I came across a rather wonderful natural experiment and wrote a paper which appeared in a book called Academic Discourse, edited by John Flowerdew. The paper was written with somebody called Nazareth Kifle, and we did the work in what is now Eritrea, I think, and in Eritrea, they had one English language textbook. I say it was a natural experiment because they also had little in the way of contact with the outside world, these school children. So we had a very nice natural experiment in which the only input they really got was from the textbook. And when we started to look at the students' productions in writing and compare those to, okay, L1 norms, it's always a difficult construct to put forward the L1. But if we looked at L1 norms, there were very clear differences between some of the usages of the students and these L1 norms that we were looking at. And these were in high frequency items. We were looking at uh, modal verbs. And of course, when we look back at the corpus that somebody just suggested we build the, the uh, textbook corpus, we found that the students' productions matched the frequencies in the textbook. Corpus. In other words, they were successful learners who had been let down by poor materials. They'd been trained to not hit the norms. And this wasn't some willful act where they thought, we're not going to go for the norms of English, we're going to go for the norms of Eritrean English. It wasn't sensible in that respect. It was just poor materials leading to poor outcomes for good learners. So, without that nice little natural experiment, and without us knowing exactly what the textbook is, we couldn't have really concluded correctly that these were good learners who were misled. So I think the idea of corporate inputs is very important, though I accept that that's an unusual example because it's such a nice little natural experiment. In terms of the use of corporate in the classroom, yes, I've always been in favour of that. I started the Teaching a Language Corpora conference series many years ago now. Uh, because of that interest. But I've always been realistic also. And I come back to a theme I came out uh, that I touched upon earlier in the talk. Corporate can answer lots of interesting questions. Corporate can make very helpful contributions. Corporate can't do everything. You know, there is still a role for other methods, the expertise of the linguist, et cetera, that need to intervene to also assist. So somebody said to me, well, you know, would you disagree with John, Tim John's idea of data-driven learning then? I'd say, well, in terms of how it was strongly expressed sometimes, yes. And I did disagree with Tim to his face when he was with us, God bless him. Um, it's a nice idea. It was a good hypothesis to drive the field along. But actually, data-driven learning, I think, has to be deployed in the context of more purposive learning, which actually may be more effective and produce better results faster for the student. But for the student who's sitting there unsupported, or the student who's curious, or the student who wants to supplement their learning, well, data-driven learning can maybe really help them. Or indeed, individual learning styles may dictate whether or not the student uh, finds data-driven learning appealing or not. So all of these questions come together into a simple answer, which is yes, I think corpora can be used in the classroom that should be used alongside other methods and as one of a number of ways of working in the classroom. And of course, the other important way in which corpora do routinely impact upon the classroom is in a secondary way in informing resources and teaching materials of the sort that I wish the students in Eritrea had had in the 1990s. Yes, 
Thank you. You've answered a lot of my questions as well. Thanks very much, Tony. And uh, I'd just like to um, thank everyone for coming and for the very interesting questions, discussions. And please don't leave yet because I believe uh, Professor Javier Guerra also gonna, will give us an introduction um, for the next talk. And so, um, Professor McHenry, I'd just like to thank you again for taking the time and to give us such a wonderful and inspiring talk. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for your chairing. Thanks to Pasquale for inviting me. And thanks to so many of you for sticking around to hear what I've got to say. Thank you, Tony. Um, Pasquale, would you like to uh, Lovely. take it off? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much, Yachi. Um, Well, thank you so much, Tony. Um, Again, I think the Q and A was was brilliant. Uh, so much in there, and thanks everyone that that contributed, shared their questions. Uh, um, unfortunately, we don't have the time to to look at uh, all of those questions. Um, so, thank you everyone. Four hundred souls got together before dinner time in the UK. Um, before dinner time in most of Europe, but probably some of you guys are just uh, all over the world. So thanks everyone. Uh, again, thank you Jachi for your chairing and thank you everyone that showed up uh, today. Uh, next week we have uh, Dr. Gavin Brooks. So stay tuned, check out our, our um, uh, Twitter account for uh, more uh, news on, on this event. So thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you.